So what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to another episode of Josh and Josh. Today we're going to dive into John Oliver's episode. Just wanted to give a reaction. I can't say that I always agree with John Oliver. Most of the time I do. I did a video a couple of weeks ago on plastics where I, I definitely agree with his stance there. But this week I actually questioned a few things. So I wanted to take you guys through that. Just give some of my thoughts as we kind of watch through this together. But yeah, let's, let's get started. Our main story tonight concerns the national debt, the world's most boring $28 trillion. And I know just saying 28 trillion might sound confusing. How much is that exactly? Well, to put it one way, it's 28 trillion dollars. To put it another way, it's 28 million millions. To put it a third way, it's an absolute fuck ton of money. But regardless, the national debt is a complete obsession in this country. Here in New York, we even have a debt clock that counts up in real time. It actually made headlines a little over a decade ago when the debt hit 14 digits. I'm the curious how much ten trillion dollars. Uh, so all the, the debts are. Squeeze a I pause this. And the dollar sign. I'm really curious, like how much all the debts are. This comes up quite a bit. I don't think we can look at just our national debt level. National debt does concern me quite a bit. Um, it gets blown out of hand. So I think it's good that that it's probably being tackled here because I do question, like, what is an appropriate level of debt? Should we have a debt at all? Those types of things. Um, just for anyone's background, I've done a lot of research around economics, and I can't say that I can't, am an economist, but there's a few schools of thoughts around economy. Um, and um, I try to get away from a, re a right versus left thought because I don't think either party really has any kind of economical view other than maybe a Keynesian view of things. But yeah, the, you know, I'm going to pull up really quickly, like how much debt do we have in Social Security? So I did want to pull this up, this U.S. debt clock that I just found, just to work through some of this. It shows the U.S. national debt at about 28, um, 28 trillion. It's really hard to get a grasp on like how much money that this actually is. There was a great video that came out in 2008 that was called the, I think the $100 million penny. I'll, I'll um, link it here, but it gives you an idea of just how much money about $16 trillion is. And once you realize they, they go through um, just creating this $100 million penny and they pour them all on the floor, but you, you realize like how much money trillions of dollars actually is. This is kind of insane. Um, and I think I just want to point out a few things like the US GDT, GDP to debt has fluctuated throughout the years. In the 60s, it was about 53%. We actually got it down to 34% in the 80s. At 2000, it was back up at, in the 50s at actually 58%. And now we're at 128%. So I think someone does need to answer that question. This is a, a little bit alarming if you're looking at the trend coming from um, 1980. This is probably just going to go up over time. And then um, I question how much Medicare and, and Social Security debt we have on top of this or if it is included in this. I don't think it is just based on some of the figures that I've, I've come across. Um, there's one article um, that I was just looking at that basically says... Um, you know, uh, these th those two programs are probably going to be worth about 101 trillion at some point. I don't know, know when that is. I get a little worried about these these projected amounts, but um, yeah, just taking a stance on this. I like. I, I hope that he's not planning on taking a stance of like this is a good thing, um, but but something we should probably be wary. Let's let's keep going. Into the same square. Pretty scary. Pretty big number. <laughs> Incomprehensible. It's too big. It is. The clock was put up in 1989 by Helena Durst's grandfather when the national debt was just under three trillion dollars. Now that the debt has passed the ten trillion dollar mark, Durst likes to recite a poem by her pass some of this here. Borrow, borrow. But the truth is, our national debt is undeniably big, and between the trillions in coronavirus. So that's good that like, that he's at least identifying like, hey, it's pretty big here. Stimulus bills and the infrastructure plans Biden unveiled just this week. It's poised to get even bigger, and Republicans in particular seem outraged by that. This chart showing, and it won't be pretty. Deficits do matter. How long do you think your family would last if every month you spent more and more on the credit card and made the minimum payment? Not long. Look, I know that all sounds pretty scary, but for what it's worth, the national debt is nothing like a credit card. For a start, we don't have 28 trillion airline miles, nor do we get letters in the mail every day saying we're pre-approved for a brand new national debt. I think I think he's right there. Um, 
you can't compare it to credit card companies. I, I don't think you can think of the points thing. The rate at which the debt is as a percentage on it is so much lower than credit cards. You know, you're talking about a 28% um, APR in some cases where um, that's your percentage, 28%. And it compounds on itself really quickly as to where um, the money creation now is almost virtually free. You know, um, we're at a zero interest rate and potentially even a negative interest rate is what it looks like we're heading towards if we're going to follow any kind of trajectory like Europe. But um, yeah, I think it's a good point to say that the, this is not the same as credit cards. However, however, there is still a, um, you, you can't continue to pay the minimum payment and keep going on. So I think that the other guy is right on that. That Pledge of Allegiance, I've talked about how much we owe the Chinese government. That is something you hear a lot. But for the record, the majority of government debt is actually owned by American investors. For example, if you... So let's check that out. I wish he would have put a little bit of a chart up here. Um, this is something that I'm aware of. Uh, I think he goes in to say basically um, a trillion dollars is held by the Chinese, more is held by Japanese. But the thing that startles me is we actually owe trillions of dollars to the Federal Reserve. Like our own banking system, we owe trillions of dollars. I feel like this just flies into the radar. I want to point out in this article too, it says the bottom line you know, it shows, shows all of these different foreign debts here. But the truth is most of it's owned to social security and pension funds. This means US citizen, citizens through their retirement money own most of the national debt. So that's what he's talking about there. Let's hold on to that though for a second because I think that that's something that we need to realize. That that we draw, draw out today is at a low, much lower interest rate than it was in the past or almost a no interest rate, but we do pay money back to the Federal Reserve. They're one of our in, in debtors. Who owns the Federal Reserve? The banks, part of the banks. Each one of the banks owns a small percentage of it, um, which is a weird thing when you see uh, banks like Chase this year buy back $30 billion of their stock and it just screws all of us over. Thanks, Chase. Anyway, let's continue. You have a pension, you might own some of that debt in the form of government bonds because they're a pretty safe investment. Foreign investors only own around a third of our debt. And while, yes, it is true, China does own over a trillion dollars of it, which is nothing. So here's the point that I was just percent. making. For what it's worth, they're not even our largest foreign creditor. Japan is. And while the debt is often talked about as being something that we're running up with new spending, the truth is, before the pandemic hit, most of our debt was the result of long, steady growth in programs that we've long ago committed to, like Medicare and other entitlements. So we are very much getting stuff for the money that we're spending. And that actually brings us to a... So that goes back to the point that we just made that, you know, most of the debt is coming in through, through those programs. You should question that, however, though, because um, like he was saying, the indebtedors are, there's a thought that um, creditors are going to show up and basically demand the money. And that's not true. However, he is not really identifying the fact that what can happen is these bubbles do burst. So if you're unable to pay that, you're unable to fund these programs. So the, the bubbles start to burst um, just due to that. And, and, and there's a trickle down. So. Really important point here. Going into debt can actually be a good investment for the country. Essentially, as economists will tell you, the key question is, are you spending money on the right things? We need to think of the debt. Are you creating money for real economic activity? If you're doing it just to get somebody money, then yeah, you got a problem. But if I'm a private individual and I go to the bank and say, I got this wonderful new idea. I just need the money to build my factory. Nobody says, oh, that's horrible. You just increased the money supply. Because we all go, yeah, but there's a factory there. It's a real thing. Um, I think he's right here. You know, um, going into debt can be good for the country. And I've heard this quite a few times. I watched Paul Krugman's masterclass on masterclass. Um, I actually hated it. I, I should do a review of it. Um, I, I don't agree with him on a lot of things, but I do get the general sense of where this is going. This is coming from just a new thought of 
um, the Keynesian thought, the more that we print, the better that it is. And, you know, I'm going to question this a little bit later on because there's some serious problems going on, like wealth gap issues. Last year alone, 20% more went to the wealthy just due to all this money creation. So there's just this thought that we create this. And then on top of this, too, there's a general negative thought. You know, there's all these negative things that the more, more we produce, the better that it is. But the more factories that we have, the more uh, potential CO2, global warming, more plastics, more of these things, more, 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 right? And there's no question of like, well, what's the right amount? Right. What, when, 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 are, when do we have enough? So um, I think he's a little bit off on this thinking here. And I think a lot of the economists, especially Paul Krugman, like I, I wish I could debate Paul um, on this front because the general thought is just creating more, more crap in the atmosphere, more and more and more. For what reason? You know, do we need more plastic stuff everywhere? Probably not. But um, yeah, you know, I, I, I debate that. Right. Taking on debt to build a factory that creates jobs and increases economic output is probably a smart investment, especially if it's one that makes this actual pillowcase depicting a nude Nicolas Cage lounging in a banana peel with two giant foxes in the background. I mean, look at this thing. As the description says, it has an sophisticated scene with stylish style. And I am more than happy to co-sign on both of those claims. And the reason that I am confident is... I guess that pillow's sold on Amazon. I'm going to link it below if you want to get yourself a version of that. But um, that's a pretty cool pillow. I think I'm going to check that out. Extremely valuable companies got that way in part because they had long periods where they spent a shitload more than they took in. So I'm going to pause here. So he, he's identifying and comparing the United States government to Amazon, Tesla, and Uber, which I think is very dangerous, actually. Bad. You, I think you, you're making a big mistake here, John. And here's why. The government does not create um, wealth, period. It taxes people to get wealth, but it does not create wealth um, or things or generate things. Um, it can borrow money to create roads, but ultimately they use companies to do those things, which actually creates a monopoly within itself through these government programs. I remember um, watching major companies like Oracle and, and other ones basically get these major com company government company contracts. And in my opinion, um, those companies are going to win at the end of the day as they continue to win those, those government contracts um, because you're given an unfair advantage versus just handing the money out um, to everyone and trying to give everyone, everyone jobs. So these big contractors walk away with just tons of money. It should almost be like a nonprofit organization that runs a lot of these. these maybe they do, I don't know. But um, again, I, I think it's really dangerous to compare Amazon, Tesla, and Uber to the government for that reason and, and saying like, hey, um, if the government goes into debt the same way that Amazon, Tesla, and Uber does, that they're going to produce as many things as they can and that the more things that the government has open, the better that it is. I mean, think about going to the DMV. How much do you, do you enjoy that? Like how much are these government programs that great? And I'm not for or against the government because I think people just, you know, I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I hate both parties equally, which we'll talk about here soon. But I, I, um, I, I, I question his thinking when it comes to this. So I, I, I don't do this. So as you can see, already things are a lot more nuanced than simply, hey, Uncle Sam, please stop digging. And it is worth taking a moment to look at the history of the debate over the national debt because the argument the Republicans often make is that they are the responsible ones who want to reduce the debt and rein in spending, whereas Democrats don't give a shit about it and just love recklessly throwing around money. But that story... So let me pause here. This comes back to... Um, I think John Oliver has a big problem with this Republican versus Democrat divide. Just as I mentioned, I, I, I hate both parties. And the way I view it is, um, for some reason, there's a used car lot. People divide the car lot in half. And they go, these used car salesmen are better than these used car salesmen when they're, they're, they're honestly like all used car salesmen. Um, if you find out, I, I've worked in politics for a short period. I hated it. Um, what you find is it just breeds with corruption. Like 99% of po politicians are um, corrupt. And if they're honest, they don't last very long, just like a used car salesman. So I'm getting, getting kind of tired of this Republican versus Democrat re divide. Um, I think the last election was like being trapped in a jail and basically trying to gang up with, you know, this party, you know, won't beat me up as much as this party. Well, you're in jail and both parties suck really bad. And I think we need to start questioning our system in general. So um, the, you know, if the goal of this is just to go like, hey, uh, debt for 
us as good and that's the way the, the Democrats feel, go Democrats, I, I think you're way off. Anyway, this isn't racist, but it's going to be like slavery when that note is due, right? We are going to be beholden to a foreign master. Uh, yeah, no, that's just not how any of that works. The debt isn't going to just suddenly come due all at once, and being in debt to someone is not the same as being enslaved by them. If you think... A yeah, I would agree with that. Let me pause that there. Um, yeah, I tend to agree with, the, with John Oliver. There's not going to be a, a debtor. However... He's missed the point that debt bubbles are the thing that you should be fearful of. So I know he's trying to make a joke here. You know, it's an entertainment show. Um, but the bond market, go look at the business bond bonds right now. Like it's, it is insane what happened last year. Um, I think they are $10 trillion in um, debt right now around like just bad, bad bonds is what they they put them in. And um, I could be speaking off, by the way, or the, that stat could be way off. So, so go look that up, but as eventually that bond bubble will crack, will crash. So that's the things we need to worry about and then the ripple effect from that. So there's not gonna be a debtor that shows up, but there is gonna be bubbles that break. Yeah, I would pause here and say Trump, I would agree with him, Trump said a lot of things he didn't deliver on, which is you know, like eliminating the US debt in eight years. I mean, you could have given, given the guy 50 years and have done nothing dude, dude, worthless um and then uh draining the swamp i mean there's a list of things that could probably just make him scroll here for hours of just stuff he promised everyone tax cuts resulting in huge deficits most corporations who benefited used the money not on investments in things like factories but on stock buybacks as for individuals nearly half the tax cuts went to the top five percent this is 100% true. I have a friend that works in the banking industry that let me know this one day. Um, as I mentioned, Chase uh, has spent $30 billion in stock buy back buy buybacks this year, despite just being in a horrible shape, right, after all this, this uh, coronavirus. And <laughs> $30 billion in stock buybacks. Cool. Cool, guys. And then um, just all the Bitcoins and crap that people are buying. There's just a SOL for everyone that's on the street that does nothing for us, very little. There's so many better ways that this stuff could be spent. Um, so I couldn't agree with him more on, on this this particular point that uh, like screw, screw anyone that's got stock buybacks going on right now. We should stop buying stuff from all these companies that are doing this crap, really. Like, like the, there's, I don't know how else to, to fight back on it, but um, Chase, I don't plan to, to bank with you. Sorry, done. And the interesting answer to that is nobody really knows. I want to pause here and just identify. Um, there, I feel like there's an assumption that like all debt is just good debt, right? That, that the more we generate, the better that it is, right? And I think that that's really dangerous thinking. Um, I think we need to divide out what's been good debt versus bad debt and then identify really how, how that has come to be. We should be really smart about what that level is. And he's right. No one really knows. There's just an assumption. But again, I want to come back. Like the gener the government does not generate anything. They generate no wealth whatsoever. And there's a general, again, general thought that the more that the government owns, that the better that it is. And I, d I don't agree with that. Um, so I think we really need to question and scrutinize this. There's probably a th ton of things that we could surface as a nation um, a list of things. These are all the things your money is being spent on. And I think people would go through and redline it really quickly on like, why are we spending so much here? Uh, there's stories in Afghanistan of just these $100,000 bricks being thrown around. Um, and there's a lot of just weird stuff too. Um, $116 trillion went missing from the Federal Reserve that they think put, they pushed over to Europe. And there's not a lot of tracking or trace of this. They tried to do an audit of it. No one agreed to do it. Like, why? Why, why aren't we questioning where some of this money goes. Um, so, you know, I think it is dangerous to, sh to have this assumption that all debt is good debt. Now, he went on to point out that there are any number of possibilities. It may have something to do with aging populations in advanced economies, China's high savings rate. The so let me pause it there. Um, this is a really great point. The aging populations, Elon Musk brings this up because he says that this is going to be a big thing that we have to worry about. All of our programs are based on this kind of pyramid that you have um, where this pyramid where essentially 
um, the old and then the young grow up to support them. But what we're finding is the pyramid is getting turned upside down um, as to where there's going to become many more old people in the community because the populations are getting smaller and smaller to be able to support that base. So we're going to have this kind of upside down pyramid versus what we have today. Now this works really well for Social Security, Medicare, because the thought is, is you know, if we can borrow that or borrow against the ones below, um, they will feed into that because there'll be an exponential amount. But the data shows in Japan, for example, there's more incontinental adult diapers sold than baby diapers. And we're starting to see some trends happen all across the globe, um, even here in the United States where people are having smaller and smaller families. Um, especially as the population size grows. So these programs and these systems, these debt programs that have been created on this are going to collapse when the, when the table turns and it actually does become this upside down um, pyramid. This won't happen overnight. Um, it'll become a square and it'll change a bunch of forms. So that's one thing that we do need to identify is that things don't really happen overnight so much, but um, we should identify that. I know he's going to get into this. So let, let me address the inflation thing. Inflation is not really tracked properly from what I understand. Um, and I would say that this is true with, with housing costs. Like housing costs aren't really brought into that that, that much. Um, and the nation's just seen an explosion around rental cost. Um, I think there's a been a 25% increase in some areas in rental cost from this time last year to this time today. So despite all this new money getting created and pumped out into the economy and thinking, you know, does a great thing. What it does is it essentially floods the bottom up. So um, the mass part of the population that isn't making that much can't float above it. They can't, they can't stay on the land above it. So they en end up drowning in these higher costs. Um, all this new debt borrowing, it creates new amount of money for every dollar that's created. Um, it creates inflation, no matter what you, you think it does. Um, there's a few arguments against that, but in most cases it catches up to itself. And the wealthy generally get the money first, so they get to spend it when the inflation rate isn't very high, and then it trickles down, and then whenever the lower classes do eventually get it, it's, it's at a smaller rate. This is not identified at all in this episode, which I think is another big miss. I get it, you know, like he only has so much, and it's an entertainment show, but... Um, that is something that we need to point out is that inflation rate is something that's kind of ignored. Um, it's like 30% of college graduates today that have a family cannot feed their family was one of the stats that I've heard one of um, Scott Galloway's recent episodes. So um, I don't know, it's a, it's a bit concerning to just kind of play off um, the debt rate to inflation. General lack of capital. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office has now said the debt to GDP ratio has no set tipping point where a financial crisis is imminent. So and again, I think this isn't a debt to GDP. It's um, identifying what those bubbles are that are out there. So um, to just blindly blanket the, the, the landscape, I think is again, dangerous and um, not identifying some of these debt bubbles that are out there that are gonna potentially cause some of these collapses that are gonna then create, create them to want to generate more wealth that is just gonna get sucked up by the wealthy. The, the poor continue to lose, the prices continue to go up, more yachts are built and more of these things for the wealthy. But um, yeah, just uh, I don't agree with this. So taken together, all of this has made many economists start changing the way that they think about debt, thinking that very basically, so long as our economy grows at a rate greater than the interest that we're paying on our debt, we can come out ahead in kind of the same way that you would come out ahead if you borrowed money at 2% interest and then invested it somewhere and got 5% returns. But the larger point is this whole field is in a bit of flux right now. Some economists believe that we should not get too complacent that a debt crisis is still on the horizon, just not at the tipping point that we previously thought. Another more radical argument is that the government can in fact create all the money it needs to pay for stuff as long as it doesn't generate inflation. Boom, there it is. So there's the mic drop is, as long as it does not generate inflation. Um, so there's the problem. Go look at the tracking on what inflation follows. At one point in time, they didn't like how gas and food <laughs> were going up energy cost. So they took those out of the inflation rate. And um, 
I'm not sure what's in, in the inflation rate today, but I find the government tends to tweak it based on what's low. So let's keep the electronics in there, right? Because the inflation rate, those always go down. Um, and uh, let's maybe put the gas back in because it's been going down or, uh, you know, it's been, so this happens throughout the years. Um, and I, I, this could be wrong, uh, this, this approach that he's taking. Um, but, I, you know, I, I have a tendency to agree. The point is, there is a good faith debate to be had over how to handle our national debt over the long term. But right now, most economists actually agree that with interest rates at historic lows, the question shouldn't really be how much debt are we taking on, as much as what is the value of what we are getting for it in return. And I think that's a good point to make. You know, so, so maybe this is their division of good debt versus bad debt. Um, and he does make a good point that the money that's getting borrowed is at a low rate. Again, I question it because it has a tendency, unless it's getting shipped out straight to people, um, to find its way to the wealthy wealthy um, business owners. And it's because if you think about it, the money machines are basically set up, all these industries are set up um, for consumers to go out and spend. Consumers can always spend more, right? But the wage rate doesn't actually go up more, right? More jobs might get created, but you don't actually see wages going up. And, and, and in fact, wage to inflation ratio has been detrimental over the years if you pull up any, any of the charts around that. So, um, yeah. And there are certainly dumb fiscal decisions that we could make, like tax cuts for the rich. We've tried that multiple times now. And if they were the magic key to eliminating our debt long term, we probably would have seen signs of it working by now. But there are smart finance. I think um, those tax cuts become muddy with this new dollar creation that's pushed out. Um, and, and I wish you would pay a little bit more attention to that. Econ uh, economics is really hard. Um, it's really hard for, to understand. It's taken me years, many books, um, many things, you know, to, to, to kind of understand. And I still am not an expert. I don't really understand it that well. But I think they are muddying the waters here between... Um, tax cuts and just assuming that more taxes is good. Um, again, you have to ask the questions like, how do we get into so much debt? Um, why has the monetary system been like this? And why does it just push money out to the wealthy? Um, it goes straight to bonds. Bonds go straight to the, the wealthy. Do, who, who owns all this stuff? You know, it's, it's, um, it, it's the wealthy. You know, so the wealthy are gonna, going to benefit off this right off the bat. So I don't know if the question is like more or less debt, but more looking at the system to make sure that it's structured correctly. I don't think we've done that enough. So it's easy to go yes or no, or right or left, or whatever that is. To, and um, you're not gonna fix these country problems by doing a multiple choice, yes or no, true or false. It's gonna require an essay you know, to, to fix this in my opinion. Too little, and if it turns out that inflation or interest rates do start to rise, we should absolutely start cutting deficits, although not by cutting gut. I think he needs to understand uh, when those inflation rates start to rise that there's a momentum that comes behind them. It's not like it's just a, like instantly on and off. Um, generally, when you start to see them rise, they start to, to rise steadily over time. So um, it's kind of like a faucet that you can't, you turn on, but there's a massive delay, you know, like a 30 minute delay. If you're trying to fill up your bath, the bath would overflow. So um, they need to be aware of at what rate those inflation rates trickle in government programs that people need, but through taxing people who can afford it. Look, no one credible is saying that deficits don't matter or that we should borrow as if the sky is the limit. What they are saying is the debate shouldn't be about whether debt is good or bad. It should be about whether the investments that we are making are worth it or not. And if you are still worried about debt because you've been told that you are burdening your children and children's children's future, well, I actually have some good news for you because those future generations have a special message just for you. Hello. Hello. Hey there. We are your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. And we have a message for you. Stop using us to scare people about the national debt. You idiots clearly have no idea how it even works. Take this stupid debt clock. Do you even know what a clock is? Clock? Not a clock. Clock. Not a clock. Clock not a clock. See? See? Also, debt isn't always a bad thing. Yes, going into debt to give money back to people who already have too much of it is stupid. Like this guy. 
six flamethrower, bro. But you can also use that to build new roads and bridges. Which we'll need to drive on. You can use it to improve school. It seems to be like the only examples that they have here of, of how to use debt. Um, I would encourage anyone to explore the broken window theory because that's something that's washed over quite a bit with John Oliver, something that's just like not understand it's understood by him and his staff very well. Um, so that I, I get worried about that. But yeah, it's just always uh, this general like debt, debt, more debt's good, debt. Okay, great. Which would make us stop. So here we are at the end of the episode. Thanks for watching through it. I just want to call out, I'm curious what John Oliver's angle is here. You know, is, is this like a Republican versus Democrat angle and uh, all the Republicans have been calling out the debt level. So um, just because it's a Republican thing, we shouldn't call this out anymore. I'm done with the Republican versus Democrat war. I just can't support it anymore. I hate both parties equally. They're both horrible. I can't express that enough. And... Um, I, I don't know if this is a smart approach, just going like, hey, you know, let, let, let's do this. Can we be smart with our money and how we spend it? Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone can answer that question. It seems like a hard thing to do and people people don't like it. They don't like, like, like to ask and answer hard questions. So, um, yeah, I can't, can't say that I completely agreed with everything in today's episode, but um, interesting. If you like this, uh, check out my plastics episode from a couple of weeks ago uh, that I did and um, tune back. Let me know if you like this. We'll keep doing these John Oliver reviews as he, he sticks them out because I feel like um, he needs a little bit of a truth, truth set um, that someone that's not a Republican and not a Democrat. So thanks for tuning in. Josh and Josh, we'll catch you next time. Bye.